Welcome to Spacious Creative. I am Cindy Ingram. And I am Heather Doyle Fraser. And in this podcast, we're exploring the process and practice of creativity, but with the foundation in compassion. In this limited series, we'll dive into how creative expression shows up in our lives, from childhood inspirations to the challenges of perfectionism and everything in between. Whether you're reconnecting with your inner child or reimagining your creative identity and how you can harness more creativity in your life, Spacious Creative is here to inspire and support your journey. Cindy, I'm so glad we're talking about creativity today. I mean, every conversation that we have pretty much is around some kind of creative thing. And I just love talking about this with you. (laughs) I know it's just the best. Like, I think every conversation we have ever had has been related to creativity in some capacity. It's our our lives. So Yeah. 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 That's we live, live and breathe creativity. Yeah. So have you always been a creative person? What's your earliest memory of creativity? Yeah. I mean, I have always, I think I've always viewed myself as a creative person because one of my like core earliest memories, I had that feeling. And I mean, this is probably, this is like probably one of my first memories, like of being a human, the and they're very, there's two and they're very, there were like at the same time or very, very close to the same time. Part one is I had my, my parents had gotten me this cardboard Holly hobby house. You know, this is the 1970s, <laughs> early 1970s. And I'm probably like three ish, <laughs> like between three and four. That's probably the time that it is. And I loved this Holly Hobby horse, not horse. I love this <laughs> Holly Hobby house. And outside it looked, you know, like it was, you know, like colorful and everything inside. It was just cardboard, brown cardboard. So that was a bit of a disappointment. I remember going in it and being like, oh, <laughs> so then I brought in like crayons and different things and was drawing things on the inside to make it more colorful. I also brought in like some, like, I remember having a blanket in there and like, it was probably a bean bag or a pillow or something to sit on. Cause I remember sitting in there and I wasn't on the floor and I already was my dad read to me every night, even at that age. And I loved books even then. And so I I remember wanting to write stuff and in order to, to like help me serve that, I guess my mom gave me an old phone book. Um, now I don't know if anyone remembers what old phone books looked like, but they were very thick papers, very thin, like tons of pages. So that's the thing that I, I, I was like, Oh, I get this whole big gigantic thing. I can do whatever <laughs> I want in it. And so I drew in it. Was I was pretending to write in it. I mean, like, you know, I wasn't really writing. I don't think at that point, but I was for me, I felt like I was doing serious creative work. I remember like re- doing, like being in it and like, you know, going through it. And I remember loving that feeling of just creating And so that was part one of that. And then the other part of that memory, I don't know why these are so connected for me, but I remember waking up one morning and my mom came in the room and I had woken up before she came in and I had written a song with a melody and lyrics about spring and the Easter bunny. And I sang it to her and I thought it was the most brilliant. I mean, I literally was like, so excited about this. (laughs) (laughs) And so I was like, this is the best song ever. Spring is here. That's what it's called. (laughs) And, um, I remember my mom was like, that's, that's great. Yeah, that's great. But she also was a, you know, singer, songwriter, performer. So I was, I had that in my life 
all the, I was already singing. I was already doing all of that, even at three, like literally at three. So it didn't seem, she didn't react to it. Like I was expecting. It wasn't like a big deal. It was like, yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> so it, I didn't get like the, the pump that I wanted there. Yeah. I do remember feeling like, Oh, mm. but I still loved the song and I thought it was pretty awesome. You still know the song. I remember a little bit of the, I remember the beginning part of it and the beginning part of the melody, which, and it's very simple as you would imagine from like, but spring is here. Spring is here. Da, 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 da. I don't know that, what those like, uh, da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. that's what it was basically awesome. probably something with the Easter bunny in there and also spring again and again. What I like about this and it, and it's, as you're talking, it's reminding me of like my own childhood and my own memories. And I, mine was similar in that, like, it's not limited to just one art form, right? You're drawing, you're writing, you're making music. And when I think, think about myself as a child, like that's what it was too. It was, it was all manners of expression. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't think that we couldn't do that yeah of course we can write we a song of course we right can. yeah right and we didn't think that we had to be like one thing with art of you know like we're we're giving this broad like creativity and art kind of definition here anything not just like one modality okay. and you're a child you know you think you can do it all because you can yeah <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I, I was the exact same way. Like I just, I like, I, I, I was always drawing. I do remember that, but then I, I was, I play piano and I would write my own music. I still have the sheet music. I want to, I never actually played it since, since then I stopped when I was like in sixth grade, when it stopped being fun, it was like the, the practicing was too, like, I have a story about that too. Yeah. And I really wish I would have stayed with it because I was really good at it. I mean, I got like medals and stuff, but I, I just, I don't have a memory of me not being a creative child. Like I, oh, I was, yeah, there's no part of my existence that ever was like, no, you weren't creative then. And then you were. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like that's I, like a core first memory. Yeah. Yeah. We had a little Muppets, Muppet Babies keyboard and that played, you know, those keyboards, like had some tunes that were already in there. And right. I, we wrote a song, me and my sister wrote a song to the tune of the Muppets baby keyboard. And we both can still sing it today. And I'm not gonna, you, you sang you're so beautiful, but mine was like, God made the trees, God made the plants, God made the trees, God made the plants. Like it was this whole thing about, it was about God, which is really funny to me now. And I used to like, Hang, like make for all holidays I would decorate my room but I, we didn't have you know like a lot of stuff so I would like made them out of like I remember tissues go set go set of tissues and hang for my ceiling fan or I would make paper chains it was just always always redecorating my room and rearranging my room and like just always Same. in that like creative energy and and then and then I grew up and then kind of stopped Mm -hmm. did you did you stop at a certain yeah. point so I I I had the you know like I remember when I got to school when I I remember when in kindergarten by that time I was reading and but nobody else was really and my teacher didn't believe me that I was reading I don't think at first and then I I would like do I would be able to read something and then she'd be like no no we're not going that fast slow down and I I felt like I was constantly being like pulled oh. back type of thing um and first grade I had a um I had a teacher who was a nun who um really kind of uh, turned my creativity off for a little bit, I think, or like made me hide it quite a bit because I had, we were doing a handwriting paper, like, you know, tracing, and then you do it on your own type of thing. And there were, there were pictures on it that you could color in, which we were allowed, allowed to color <laughs> in. And I colored those in and I just didn't think it was enough. 
So I added my own drawings to it and made a border and, you know, did all this other stuff. And everyone around me was like, Heather, that is so pretty. You have to go show sister this. You have to go show her. It's so good. And I had, I did have an internal feeling, I vividly remember it thinking, really, should I do that? I don't know if I should do that. Uh, I don't know if she would like it. But everyone kept saying, it's so good. You should show her. So I showed her and that was not the right move. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was not appreciative. In fact, told me that I had to now do a new one. And I was the type of student that make, made her wish she'd never become a teacher. Oh. So, <laughs> from, <laughs> so I was like, okay, that is too much, Heather. You need to... You need to rein it in. So I did. And I became pretty quiet. And not that I wasn't, I mean, I think I was more of an, you know, observer to begin with, but I wasn't, I was just afraid to go outside of the lines, literally and figuratively. Well, it um, really like was like a feels like a metaphor for really how it is, how creativity is in general. There is this um like protective nature of it that it's like you know like I made a artwork over the weekend and I usually just share I share a lot of things because you know my business is art related so I share as much as I can but like this one I was like oh I don't know that I'm ready to share this yet I was like is this good enough is this like or is this going to be accepted is this it, I really like it but what if someone else what if you know what if someone else doesn't like it and like I have there's this, this am I ready to hear that am, if they right yeah yeah am I ready for it just to be yeah be out in the open and not just mine my own personal thing that I hold dear like and it's, it's really interesting to hear that like you had that at, in first grade, you had that same yeah. um, experience. I did have that feeling. And I probably just because I knew I kind of had a, a conception of that teacher, you know, like I knew that she yes. wasn't going to be overly excited about something like that. <laughs> she wasn't a safe, a safe space to no. um, and share. I, I had that feeling like I, I still remember like just that, you know, in that bodily sensation of being like nervous and like, you know, just like, I don't know, but everyone says I should. So, and I, I wanted to believe that mm. be accepted, but I didn't have obviously the wherewithal at, you know, six <laughs> to handle that situation. <laughs> oh. Um, but it's kind of similar to the, the story with your mom is like you, you, you were so excited about something and you wanted mm -hmm. someone else to be just as excited as you, but that wasn't shutting me down either. That, that was just yeah. like, you know, yeah, of course you can do. It was almost like, yeah, of course. Why wouldn't you be able to do that? I do that every day sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so it didn't have the same impact on me yeah. as that. It, it didn't make me stop writing songs or anything. It didn't make me stop doing anything creative. Whereas this one, that experience, it didn't stop me from doing it, but I did not share it when I, I probably did it like much more just for myself at yeah. that point and wasn't as open around like letting that be seen as much. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a pretty dramatic reaction from your teacher yeah why was, like, was, you, was, you was make ridiculous. me not want to be a teacher because yeah, you drew like, some stuff on the yeah. borders and I was like the perfect student so yeah you know at that I mean I I just was so that was yeah. that felt devastating and so I just kind of you know just didn't shine as much there and it came back though like it wasn't like it was like forever gone it like once I hit you know, like that, like early teen, preteen time when emotions are super high, there's like artistic things were the way that that comes, mm -hmm. came out for me. Like I was writing stories, I was writing poetry, I was writing like all kinds of things like that. I was also reading, obviously reading never stopped for me, but I was, you know, like 
doing all, and I was drawing and doodling and, you know, doing different things, total rearranging all the time of the furniture. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> let's try it this way. But I mean, like that is, is, is helpful. Just get a perspective change. I mean, now yeah. I see that as a very creative out, a big creative outlet at the time. I'm, I'm sure that just annoyed the heck out of my mom. Yeah. <laughs> not my dad so much, but you know, my mom. And I would say that that kind of spurt of creativity lasted for a few years, maybe like fifth grade, sixth grade to like sophomore in high school ish. And then I felt it like a constriction of it again, a bit, just because like the academic rigor and, and needs were high, you know, to get into, you know, for college and scholarships and all those things. So I feel like even though I was doing, I wasn't doing a lot of fun writing for myself or like art, I was performing in musicals and plays and things like that. So I was getting some creativity there and of course, always singing and things. So, but I wasn't like creating as much for myself, really. It was always like with a specific outcome activity involved. That was really the same and, for me. Yeah. That, that would, yeah. that time period was like the, the period where I wrote the most poems, <laughs> like fifth right. grade, to sophomore right. year of high school. So many poems. So many, because I feel like, what are you going to do with all that emotion that you have yeah. this, and all this new, all these new feelings and like insight that you never noticed because you were, you were like a true kid and now you're an adolescent and yeah a teen and you see everything that's going on and you feel it too. Yeah. So tell me about, tell me a little bit about, about your stuff there. Oh yeah. Just, well, I had kind of a sad or, you know, a sad childhood and that my had an alcoholic dad and he disappeared when I was in the third grade. And so I was just very, very sad about that. I have so many poems writing, like, and I know I can still like pull up a lot of the lines for the poems because I would read, I would write them and then I would read them over and over again. It was just like, I don't know. I think maybe it was witness my, because I didn't have anybody really to share Process. those emotions yeah. with. So it yeah. was like, I was kind of, I never thought about it in this way before, but I would write them and then I would read them over and over again. It was almost like I was witnessing myself like at the, at the same time and like giving myself comfort. And also- I was so boy crazy that a lot of them are love poems too. There's a, there's a lot of love poems in there about boys that I had crushes on and, and, and poems about friendship and poems about, I I have one. I have a lot of friendship poems. Yeah. I have, I have poems about art and, and, and how I dream of a, of a life, a career in art, you know, like it was, it was just like, I had, it was like, yeah, I was just looking to the future and I was processing the pain of now and like it just writing and writing and writing and writing. And in high school, I had the same thing happen though. It was like, I was so obsessed with my GPA that instead of like continuing in art, I took Latin because it was like, that would help me with my SATs because the, yeah. the root words. And, and I heard it was an easy A and it was like, so I started to do stuff like that. And I was really obsessed with my GPA. And then also around that time, I noticed that in art class, I've always been like talented in art, but I, and you know, the art teachers always liked me. They praised my work or whatever. But there was always like one or two kids who just had that natural gift. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it as a teacher too. There's just some kids that come just born knowing how to draw perfectly. And I'm like, they just, and then they do it all the time. So they just get better and better. But I had the, you know, in high school, especially there, I even remember their names, Stephen and David, like they were so good and they could just, they could just draw something perfectly and they could paint beautifully. And I just was like, I can't do that. So, and I I don't think I'll ever be able to do that. So I might as well, you know, lean into my, my smartness. That's, that's where I can really shine is how smart I am. So I just, I like shifted away from art into like 
trying to get the highest GPA in class rank possible. Yeah, um, I can relate to that. I mean, I, 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 I probably, I, I did go away from like, art stuff. Although I was in always in like music stuff. I always did that mm -hmm. just because it was it seemed like I would never not be able to not do that. So, it's and I, and I love you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I did love that, but I, the, the whole GPA thing, you know, be the best you can be like all of that. Yeah. I definitely was in, in the throes of that. And I had that experience of if if you're not going to be the best, then why are you doing it? What's yeah. Why it's not worth it. If, unless you can be the because best. Because I was really like in my mind, I was the best at some things or as good as I could possibly be in some things. And those are the things that I stuck with. Yeah. Like I, I took piano too when I was little and I had like a really amazing ear so I could you could play something for me. And if it was simple, I could play it back without like in a moment I could do that. But then as things got more, and so I was learning things really by ear, not by reading music. That's what mm. was happening. So I could pick it out and play it. And people were like, wow, this is, she's amazing. She's so good. And then as the pieces got more complicated, I couldn't pick it out by ear anymore because there was so much more going on. It wasn't, you yeah. know, just one baseline, one, you know, it was just, it wasn't simple. So then I was falling behind and that felt terrible and that felt awful. And so I stopped doing that because it was like, you know, just too, too much. And I was little, I mean, I wasn't very old. I mean, I was like first, second grade. And then I took lots of other instruments in, well, not lots. I took clarinet and I played clarinet and saxophone and I picked those instruments because I knew my mom couldn't play them. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I need something that she can't do because I need, I need to feel like I can do that and she can't do it. So that's why I chose those instruments. And of course, then later on I played, I, I had to drop that to, for all the choir type things and, you know, vocal things in in high school, but, and I, of course, played guitar and other things now too. But yeah, it's interesting how we let, we get, well, we get, we, it's not our fault. We get sucked in to this machine is what happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what happens. That's but, true. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting when both of us, that's probably why we get along so well. It's like the, the wanting to be the best at something immediately without any <laughs> without any work like that is but then also I, I I think about it I'm like no there are times where it's like I I do put in the work to be the best at something but I I think I already know I'm it's possible because I'm thinking well, about math class because I was in calculus yeah. and me I too. was like wow <laughs> <sighs> I loved it. Actually, I really <laughs> loved calculus, but uh, the teacher was like, Hey, I'm just going to, you know, set your expectations y'all. Like this is AP calculus. If you're going to get a, like, she was like only one, maybe two people are going to get a five on this calculus AP test. And it's going to be Vikram because Vikram was the valedictorian and they're like, Vikram will get it. That's probably it. And I was like, like hell is Vikram going to be the only one. So I like studied my ass off to get the five on that calculus AP test. And it turns out five people got it. And I ran into her at the grocery store. It was my senior year in the grocery store in the summer. And she was like, five people got fives. I was like, yeah. And she started listing the people and she got, she was like Vikram, Brad, blah, blah, blah. and she got to the fifth and she couldn't remember who it was. And I was like, it was me. <laughs> the only reason, the only reason I got a five on that calculus AP test is to prove you wrong. And you don't even remember. So I was glad that I ran into her, but <laughs> <laughs> so I could stick in her face and how that relates to creativity is though, like that mindset of having to be the best is what kept me from making art for a very long time. Right. That perfectionistic uh, mindset stops you from making art to begin with, but then it also 
can stop you in the process. Like yeah. when you are actively working on something, it's mm -hmm. so hard. That's where compassion comes in. I mean, like you have to be able to give yourself some grace to understand why you're feeling the way you're feeling and what there are things you can do to help with that too. What are those things? Oh, well, tell us. Well, it's interesting that that early memory of mine with the Holly Hobby house that I remember, like, see, when I saw the outside, you know, cardboard thing, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so great. I remember like just loving how it looked on the outside. You know, there's like, there was a window in it, like, just, but, but when I say window, I was just a cutout, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, but there were like, there was a draw, not let not draw, but like painted on a uh, flower box on the front and, you know, things like that. So it was very colorful on the outside. And when I went in, I was like, well, this is not going to do like, this is just <laughs> not going to be, this is not going to work for me. So creating that space for myself that I knew was going to be like, this is just for me. This is just my internal like place for really for creativity, but I didn't know, I didn't have those, obviously mm -hmm. those thoughts at that point, but like, I remember bringing in something soft, like a blanket. I remember bringing in either was a pillow or a bean bag or something like that. I remember drawing things on the walls to make it look prettier, even though it was probably just a bunch of scribbles. I mean, it was probably just color, you know, like going yeah. like that, but it was what I wanted to do. So I was making a safe, like comfortable space for myself, which is what I talk to authors about and talk to people and writers to do. Like you need to create, you need to have your nervous system be regulated and feel internally safe enough to be able to create. And how do we do that? Well, there's lots of things you can do. Some of them external, some of them internal, but having an external space where you feel comfortable is one of the big things. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be anything big, but like literally making sure you're not cold or you're not hot or, <laughs> you know, like too hot or you have water or, you know, so, you know, like really basic things. And then like, you can also move into other things like, oh, I like looking out a window that where I can see some green or I, if you can, don't have that available, but you know that that's something that, that is helpful to you having a plant or, you know, like there's things that, but it is funny to not funny, but like amazing to me really that I, I think as children, we just know things that we forget later on. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it, like our, our adult life is so much about like unlearning everything we learned since high school and coming back to like who we were as children. And to me, it feels so if, when I, when I really look at myself in like elementary school, like upper elementary school, middle school, I guess they like age 10, like who I was then is it's the most true version of me almost. It's just me without all the crap that like got piled on all the expectation time. All the yeah. Agents, all those things. Yeah. yeah. It's fascinating. Cause I, I stopped making art because, well, I, I, the, the perfectionism thing came in too, because I started studying art history mm -hmm. and I discovered and like, art history. Looking at all these masters, wow, and you're they're like, like ah. <laughs> yeah, I like I I discovered art history in my junior year of high school. Between junior and senior year, my the the English teacher took a group of kids to Europe every year for like 28 days, and you go to like all the countries. I don't, I forgot how many countries went to. It was like seven or eight or something, and we did a whole class every Sunday for like a whole semester leading up to it to learn about all the countries and to learn about the art. And so it was like this really immersive experience. And I go to these museums and it's the first time I'm seeing like real art before, because I lived in Amarillo, Texas. We didn't really have museum, like the closest big city from Amarillo is like five hours away. And so I never got to see real art. And then I, suddenly I'm in Europe and I'm like looking at all this art and I just completely fell in love. 
And so I got a degree in art history. I started working in museums. I started just like obsessing over looking at art and art history and all the artists. And I'm like, there's no way I could be as good as all of these artists that I've been studying my whole life. There's no way I can create something as powerful as they can create with as much talent as they can create. I was just like, I don't have the ideas. I don't have the technical skill. I don't have, like, there's just like all the things I don't have. And so I just kind of released that as like, oh, I guess I'm, I'm not an artist. Um, and that definition of artist is so narrow. It is so narrow until 2021 when I was, I was in the middle of like a burnout and I was rethinking my, all of my work. And I was, I was like, how do I show people the power of the work that I do looking at art and connecting with it? And like, what do I, how do I, you know, I was just meditating on that. And the answer that I got that just like dropped in my head, I don't know where it came from, but it was like through your art. And I like, lost it. I was like, there's no, I can't, I was like, I don't make art first. I can't make money out of it. That was like the first thing I thought, which was just kind of gross, but that was one of the first thoughts. And two, I was like, no, I don't. I don't have the talent to do that. But the answer was like that, that like you have to make art message. Oh, clear. Was, yeah. Oh, it was so clear. I had to listen. And so I, I stalled for a good amount of time, you know, like made my art studio and I thought about the art type of art I was going to make, make sure I had the supplies, organize the supply, you know, like took a good, like, I don't know, nine months before I actually started making art again. And then, but and then I had to disassemble like what, like all those stories I taught myself about what it means to be an artist and what it means to be creative. And, and I had to like break that all apart before I could start making art. And it's changed my whole life. Like since I started, since I did that, you know, I feel like a different person. Well, I'm not even a different person. I feel like the more true version of myself than I I was just going to say like back a little bit back to that, that 10 year old. self. yeah. Yeah. I have a, not exactly the same, but similar in that. So I do remember when I went to college, this like icebreaker activity with my dorm floor where we had to like, like draw something that was, or say something or like put something on paper that like kind of described you or, you know, whatever. And I wrote goddess of creativity (laughs) on it. (laughs) And after I did, it felt so true. And I felt so good about it. And then after I was done, I was like, Oh no, I have to put this up on the wall. (laughs) You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to stand out either. You're supposed to be just good enough. You're supposed to be perfect so that no one will notice you. You're not supposed to like call yourself a goddess. also elevate you. Yeah. (laughs) So I was like, okay, all right. You know, and I, and I did, I mean, I did a lot of creative things in college but again it was usually in the pursuit of some something I mean I was still singing I was still doing a lot of things like that I but and I was doing a lot of writing but and I I you know took poetry classes which I adored and I you know did a lot of writing poetry in there but I didn't do a lot of outside of any of those classes writing really as much as I had done you know earlier on and then when, after I graduated, I, I started working a publishing company. So there was reading everyone else's work and making everyone else's work better and learning some hard things about the publishing industry. And Mm -hmm. which kind of made me feel like, you know, I don't know if I want to, I mean, I still want to write, but I don't know, this is kind of this, this corporate machine isn't exactly what I envisioned it to be. And I don't really like it. (laughs) There's no compassion there or very, very, very like maybe just on an individual basis, obviously with people, but like as a whole, no. So I was, I was doing a lot of singing during that time too, outside, like, you know, weekend job type of thing. But I really was not writing too much. I did a little bit of writing poetry 
around, like around the time that I met my husband and I had a lot of, again, a lot of emotions and things like that. So I did some poetry writing at that point until basically till right after we got married. And then that kind of shut down again a bit. And then I didn't really do a lot of writing until I left traditional publishing and it took a, a while to kind of recalibrate my nervous system really to be at a place where I could create again. And then it really came in a flood and I was writing a lot more and I was, you know, I wrote, uh, I wrote a book. I wrote, I mean, I did did two books and then I did a book with my husband and different things like that. But that what unlocked things for me there, I think, you know, I started, obviously I was doing this work to kind of regulate my nervous system, even though I didn't know at the time, that's what I was doing. And then learning about compassion and compassionate practices and how they can really help you. And when I found that it wasn't like specifically for creativity, that's just what I used it for and life in general. But like, yeah. you know, like that's what I I noticed. I, I realized this is a perfect match because if you don't feel safe enough, your creativity, you, you can't access it because you're in a threat response constantly and you can't get out of that. So. Yeah. And that's, I think one of the things that helped me so much is, you know, I, I've realized I had this big realization in 2021 and I, you know, took a while to start making art again, but right when I finally started making art again is when I started working with you and, and it was, you were kind of teaching me that those compassionate processes mm-hmm. as I was creating. Mm-hmm. And I think that there probably would have been many times where I would have like stopped or I would have gotten stuck or I wouldn't have, you know, um, taken the risks that I took if I didn't have like you and your influence as a, as a like grounding energy throughout the whole process. Well, that feels so, good. Yeah. <laughs> and so I feel like we have, this can lead to a whole other conversations in different episodes about like the flood of creativity about, you know, yes. what happened next and and that sort of thing. But I feel like this is kind of maybe a good stopping point for this particular conversation. I think so too. Yeah. So we'll be back with more conversations about creativity. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Spacious Creative. We hope you found inspiration and insights to give you some momentum on your creative journey. We're excited to invite you to our free workshop coming on July 24th. Trust your why. Your creative comfort zone needs you. In this workshop, we'll explore the widely held misconception that growth only happens when you are out of your comfort zone. You can sign up at cindyingram.com slash trust. We can't wait to connect with you again in our next episode. Until then, trust your creativity and hold your inspiration and yourself with compassion.